Hello all and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video and in today's Kerbal Space Program video I decided to try and realise an idea that I've had for quite some time now but could just never get it to work and that idea, if it wasn't obvious from this video's title and thumbnail, that idea is that of a folding base. In the past I've typically built surface bases in one of two ways. The first is to launch the base in modules, assemble the modules in space and then land the base on the surface of wherever it is I want to land it. The second way I tend to build bases is by simply building the entire base as one solid structure and then launch the entire thing as one monolithic unit without the need for any reconfiguration prior to landing and of course no reconfiguration after the landing. The beauty of this second way of doing things is that it keeps videos a bit more engaging as we spend significantly less time faffing around putting stuff in orbit and playing around with manoeuvres in order to get things to dock together and of course the base itself is generally much more solid and there's more freedom in how it can be designed since you have got to build it around docking ports. However, the chief drawback to launching bases in one launch, uh, and to be honest this also often applies to modular base components that I make as well, is that the launch vehicle itself tends to look super unrealistic because you have a fairly realistically proportioned booster with a cartoonishly wide fairing sat on top of the stack. The fairing is often more than two or three times wider than the diameter of the rocket. Now there are creative ways around this wide fairing problem, for example building custom custom fuel tanks out of similarly wide fairings or by using creative placement of the fuel tanks but for smaller bases it can sometimes be hard to figure out an elegant solution. Enter the subject of today's video, the folding base. Having a base that folds up means that we can have a nice large footprint for when it lands while also being able to have it take up relatively little space inside a payload fairing so that the actual launch vehicle looks passable in the real world. I've tried doing folding bases before but they have never really worked out and that's because in order to have a nice clean look they require lots and lots of part clipping, specifically part clipping of the robotic parts. For this build here for example we've got pistons, rotors and hinges all clipped into the base modules that then change in how they're clipped as they transition through their movement sequences and as you can imagine this leads to an ungodly amount of kraken attacks to the point that the base is basically completely unusable. However in the latest KSP update 1.12 a little feature was added that I think now may render these bases possible. The feature I refer to is the ability to disconnect strut pieces using action groups. Now we can lock the base together using struts on all the moving parts to keep them frozen in place throughout the flight and then when it comes to unfolding the vessel we can then just toggle an action group that decouples all of the struts and permits the articulating segments to move and the base can then reconfigure itself to its landed position. Once the base is in its final position we can then pop an engineer Kerbal on each EVA to attach new struts to the base to keep it locked in its unfolded state and as such minimise the chance of a Kraken attack while on the ground. Now I know what you may be thinking, Matt, surely this was possible before since engineer Kerbals could have been used to manually detach the struts using the EVA construction mode and my answer to that is yes but actually no. See in my experience and yours may well be different mind, whenever an engineer Kerbal removes a component from a structure it induces a brief period of wobble, the craft becomes a bit unstable for a few seconds, on crack and bait folded up clipped to high heaven structures like this, this gets multi applied tenfold and the whole thing basically rapidly shudders itself apart after detaching just one or two of the struts. But now we can attach them all simultaneously and instantaneously and this doesn't appear to have the same impact on stability compared to the EVA construction method. Now granted I still will need an engineer Kerbal to weld the craft back together but I find that for whatever reason attaching components to vehicles and structures is substantially less kraken summony than detaching them. Now I have zero evidence for this and everything I just said is entirely anecdotal but I guess that's my tale and that's my tale told. And as you can see from the time lapse that I failed to really address in any meaningful way up until this point, uh, the base is pretty much done. It's not the most ambitious base because although I was confident that the new detachable strut components would uh, stop the amount of Kraken attacks I was used to seeing in the past, I wasn't entirely certain and I didn't want to waste 
an entire day like I may or may not have done at some point with a fault with an unfolding base in the past so I thought let's just keep it nice and simple let's keep it very much in the prototype scale of things and have it be you know big enough to be a proper surface base like we've got all the bells and whistles we've got every science experiment bar the one you can't use on the surface of a planet or moon like the uh, uh, magnetometer boom we haven't got any scanning arms either but aside from that we know we've got all the basic science things we have a science lab we've got three observatories that all face upward in the same direction would have been nice on retrospect actually now I think about it to have them facing in different directions but it's a prototype base so I guess it doesn't matter and I can absolve myself of any and all criticisms by using that uh, uh, clarification just there when it came to the transfer stage and I guess the landing stage well to tackle them one at a time without getting too ahead of myself I'm just very excited guys the landing stage is going to be done by those two cheetah engines on those side mounted boosters that are strapped to the mobile processing lab and then the transfer stage is just going to use two skipper engines not the most efficient engines but have great thrust to weight ratios so that the video can be nice and snappy keep things moving along at a good pace and then the rest of the rocket is just a big dumb booster nothing to really write home about but Crucially, I'd say it looks fairly realistically proportioned, but you guys can be the judge of that. Well, actually, only God can judge me, okay? But you guys could be the judge of whether or not you think this rocket looks realistic, uh, which well, we haven't finished it yet, so I'll, you can reserve judgment until then. For the first stage, it's just like a, a Saturn V light. Like, it's, it's five F1 engines, or I guess the in-game equivalent of the F1 engines, arranged in that iconic five dot layout i don't know what that layout is called but the, the the number five on a dice that layout but we've not got the big uh flanges of the saturn five is that what they're called you know how the rocket gets wider to accommodate the engines um am i drawing a blank or do i genuinely not know what that word is you know what i mean right you guys know what i mean what is that is that what is the word for that? What's the technical word for that? I don't know. Anyway, it looks like the construction phase is pretty much done. And here the rocket is on the launch pad. And I think it's pretty safe to say that this does look like a fairly realistic looking rocket. Now, it's not the most realistic mission, given all the part clipping, granted. But if you want realistic missions, and perhaps if you want to learn more about, you know, actual real life space missions, then why not consider watching the documentary series Space Probes, which is one of the thousands of documentaries available right now from this video's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream has a huge library of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV that span a wide range of topics from lifestyle to history to science and to technology. They have a plethora of award-winning exclusives and original shows and it's all available on a massive number of platforms meaning you can stream their content to any of your devices to watch it anytime, anywhere. Just use the code MATLOWN, all one word, or just click the link in the description to get 25% off and pay just $15 for an entire year. Wow. And with a massive library and 35 collections of curated programs handpicked by Curiosity Streams experts, that is a ridiculously good price. I've been a big fan of Curiosity Stream now for as long as I can remember, and I cannot recommend them enough. Give it a go. It's only $1.25 per month, which is an absolutely ridiculously cheap price for the quality of content you get in return. You can rest assured that during the construction of my surface base, I was sure to incorporate a cinema room for the Kerbals to watch their favorite documentaries during their voyage to the Moon, which as you can see, has very much begun. Hey, that, that, that rhymed, that was cool. And I guess they've also got it there once they've got to the Moon, because I'm never bringing them back, but shh, don't tell them that. Oh, and doesn't the waterfall mod look gorgeous, by the way? I know I'm going to get comments asking why my rocket plumes look and, I guess, sound so great. And that's because I'm using the mod Waterfall. Oh, I love it. I only installed it relatively recently. And don't know how I managed to go this long without using an engine plume mod. People were asking me to use real plume for the longest time. And I always said, no, it's fine. But now, guys, I admit I have seen the light. And I, I'm very happy with the waterfall mod. It's great. However, it is a bit... I don't know if it's waterfall or if it's just a KSP 1.12 thing, but sometimes engine sounds just cut out. It's really inconsistent, though, like the sound. Like, it's not that the game sound has failed. The engine sound just stops just stops making noises. The engine stops making sounds. Like, if I'm flying a plane through the atmosphere, the engines are not making any noise, but the whoosh of the air is, is still there. Well, another rhyme. I'm on fire tonight, guys. Dropping drop fresh wraps, and I've ruined it, haven't I? Uh, so if the audio... I can't remember if this is one of the bits of footage I have where the audio does 
uh, clip off, and I think it does, but I can't remember. So I don't. So it, it just in case that happens in this video or another one of my videos, I think the one I did where I went to the Mun Arch last week, I think. Yeah, yeah, that one definitely had the audio glitch. I might be thinking of that one. It's all bleeding together as one, really. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not. I, I'm having a hard time keeping track of what I am and I'm not doing. I'm trying to get myself ahead of myself. If that makes, oh, that doesn't make sense. Why am I going to say, oh, if that makes sense, guys, and then just move on like that wasn't a totally weird thing to say. What I mean is that typically with Kerbal Space Program content, I try and make it so when I'm on a given week, I am creating the video for the following Saturday. So say, for example, uh, it's uh, Wednesday, the 7th of July, because that's today and I'm uncreative. So for me, I'm recording this on the 7th of July. My plan is for this video to go live on the 10th of July, which is not how I normally like to do things. I normally would plan this, so if I was recording this on the 7th, it would go live on the 17th, so the next week, because I've already got the video for the 10th made and ready to go. I find that doing things this way is just way less stressful, and it means I can do more ambitious missions like a Jewel 5 or my Kerbal X challenge, because I can afford to spend more time on a mission without feeling the time pressure of, oh my gosh, Saturday, that was a weird way of saying gosh, I said gosh, no, <laughs> oh my gosh, Saturday is rapidly approaching, I've got to get things wrapped up and it's not working, oh my goodness, and I have a massive meltdown, <laughs> so um, it's, it's a much more stress-free way of living, however, I'm not doing that at the moment, I'm still doing the video for a given week on that week, and I've been stuck in this rut for quite some time, so I'm trying to make lots of content very quickly, have a very stressful week or two, to get myself at that two-week sweet spot where I'm two weeks ahead and then I can relax and we can slow down put the brakes on and go to normal pace again but uh, it's just, uh, there's been a few curveballs in my life uh, for example Kerbal Space Program 1.12 came out which is weird to call a curveball but it um, it meant I had to make two Kerbal Space Program videos in one week which um, then sort of sets me back and I'm happy to do that because everyone loves watching the update videos they get a lot of views I am fairly compensated and I'm always of course very grateful to squad the developers and all my friends there to um to hook me up with early access to updates so it's not like a burden it's just another thing that messes with my uh intended schedule of having my uh work plan you can tell this is an unscripted video right <laughs> my work plan be two weeks ahead anyway um managed to not talk about a single thing in this video but by the way we're going to the man probably should have said that earlier but i'm landing this on the man because it's not a very exciting destination i admit but you guys have no idea how many hours i've wasted in my life over the last year maybe <laughs> uh, since robotic parts came out so actually that was that was 2019 when breaking ground came out wow i'm time does fly doesn't it uh, yes I've, I've spent i've wasted many hours unsuccessfully trying to do surface bases that just succumb to crack and attack so i thought you know what i'm going to keep the scale of this small i'm just going to go to the mun i don't care because it's probably not going to work but obviously the proof is in this video that existing that it did in fact work and you can watch that be manifest make manifest on your screens and uh, i did mess up the landing a bit like i i got it right here and then i started to veer off course a little bit in fact, no, I was dissatisfied with the slant of the surface. So I decided to quickly boost up uh, with the engines. Didn't quite cook it enough. Let's get a little bit higher so we can try that again. I've got plenty of delta V, uh, over a kilometer per second of delta V at this point. So we're fine for fuel. And then we can go ahead, point retrograde to the surface and try again. That's one of the reasons why I've got so much fuel in our landing stage, because I really wanted to have enough fuel to really be able to fine tune our landing spot. Even if we don't get it right on the first, like, five attempts, we've still got loads of fuel to hop along the surface until we find a suitably flat spot. And now we have found and landed at a suitably flat spot. I'm just going to detach the side boosters and fly them away so that they are... Uh, no longer attached as if that needed saying. You might have noticed that I've got the force percent set to basically nothing so that they don't end up falling over and then when I fire up the engines they just slide along the surface and bits explode but not the whole thing. Uh, doing it this way helps guarantee that it all exploded as one piece of debris flew away. I mean granted that isn't exactly how I wanted to dispose of that booster. I wanted to just fly it up so its apoapsis is really high and then switch back to the base. Whenever I did that it would then just reappear attached to the base. It was super odd, so I kind of had to just deliberately crash it myself. And there is the base unfolding, almost ended up just tangenting during the most critical part of this video. But there we are. It's um, 
it's getting there. It's, it's quite a slow process. And there we have it. It's all unfolded just about. We need to do a few things like deploy the solar panels and we can adjust the spring and damper strengths. And of course, we need to weld it all together because it's all well and good at the moment. But I just, I've, I'm very jaded by this game. I don't trust it. So we've got to get a Kerbal Engineer out there just to add a few struts, which I've got inside a small cargo module by the front door to the, the front door the front airlock uh, there's a small uh, cargo space there with some struts inside it that the Kerbal engineer can use to, can use to strut those two side modules to the main core and then uh, strut the solar panel arm to the to the main core as well and uh, Lested is that Lested Kerman yes Lested Kerman she's rocking the new not SpaceX <laughs> space suit at all See, look, there's a bit of a wobble on that module, but as soon as we add that strut, stabilizes. So I guess there's still a little bit of a springiness, although that might be a fault of the landing gear rather than the uh, very unstable nature of this craft's design. So we'll let it slide. And speaking of sliding, that is a, an issue that a lot of surface bases encounter. Not this one because we've got landing legs. And landing legs, in general, do a good job in keeping things stationary. But... There is a new part that was added to the game and then not added to the game when final release came out, and that was uh, the KSP Ground Anchor, where you can, like, it drills itself into the ground, and then you can use a Kerbal to attach stuff to it. And I didn't really get... I, I used it just when I was filming footage, but then it got cut from the game and my early access version of it, and then I didn't... I, I don't know if I, could, I might have been able to figure out a way of bringing it back, but I could be bothered. I'm like, at the end of the day, squad don't want people to see what it is just yet, so I'm not going to try and try and use it. But I can't wait to actually get that part because that's going to be so good because I can see so much potential for really, really creative and bizarre base designs when we don't have to worry about the base falling over or sliding. One of my big ideas would be having some sort of maybe cliffside base, like have a base that's anchored to this to the edge of a cliff that would be amazing uh, or even like and this is one of my big ideas would be maybe having a base that kind of suspends itself beyond the ridge of the mohole i know i think stratum blitz did a mohole base where it was worked on a cantilever system but this could be something far more simple like basically just have a giant uh arm that's drilled into the side of the mohole and then have a you know, platform at the end of the arm, and that's where the base is all suspended. No need for a massive, convoluted, and complicated heavy cantilever system. That I think, in fact, was Strats and Blitz's undoing, unfortunately. I know that base didn't really work as he hoped it would. It was very susceptible to crap attacks. I can't remember exactly what went wrong, but I know something went wrong. Maybe the ground anchor is the solution, but there's so much potential, and hey, stock hanging monarch bases could be a thing. Like, I know people have done it by janking, like, st uh, octagonal struts around the perimeter of the monarch but again it's a bit messy probably a little bit cr to cr prone to kraken attacks but imagine just having a kerbal eva up drill a you know ground anchor to the bottom of the mun arch then attach a docking port to it then just drive the base under fly it up and it just docks to the docking port and it just hangs there with no superstructure you know winding its way around the rim of the monarch it's gonna be so cool i really really cannot wait for that part to get added by the way i did a quick eva over to that crater just because it looked interesting and wanted to get some well i guess i wanted to just do something that was fun on the surface of the mun can you forgive me guys okay you were so critical of me oh, i'm joking i just I, I i just invent things for myself and then get angry at them don't i i thought i'd do the obligatory surface base unpack i can add all of our little breaking ground science units just because they look so cool and it makes the base look a little bit more complete but i guess that does you know tie up what's happening in the video the surface base is complete i do hope you like oh, brilliant shot there what a what a what a what a drive i don't play golf sorry <laughs> uh, yes the, what do you think i know i said it's kind of a smaller scale base because it really is a prototype it's not going to be anything ambitious so i know this is going to get a million views and be my most popular video of all time but you know i i think it is a nice base nonetheless aesthetically speaking and it proves the concept that unfolding surface bases do in fact work now maybe hopefully possibly not going to guarantee that but it looks like they might you know so maybe in the future i could do something slightly more ambitious but that'll be for a future video which may or may not be on screen if you're watching this in the future hello by the way how did england do in the euros there's a topical thing that's outdated now um that's it i didn't even talk about anything on screen my patrons are scrolling and they can join the squad in the join button below